This is Dr. Gooden with Complex Cognitive Processes. Um, so here we have complex cognitive processes and we see that how they affect a number of different things from concept formation to thought to problem solving to uh, what we call transfer to diversity in complex cognitive processes. We're going to see how all these things are related. The learning goals of this chapter, um, if we were to, to enumerate them, uh, would be to define complex cognitive processes, describe theories of concept formation, apply methods to promote concept formation and conceptual change, understand. Now, you, you're welcome to read this. What you're doing probably is tuning out. I know I'm tuning out as I'm reading. But you do want to have goals, and this is only an example, at least have goals for yourself of what you want your students to understand from each chapter, um, each lesson that you give them. Um, so we might think of complex cognitive processes. We'll just focus on the new version here, uh, which is more active um, oriented. Um, you see application is applying. So, um, and yeah, so basically we're, we're going to focus on uh, the fact that people remember, they, that we want them to understand. And when we, when we make these, we want uh, application of methods, understanding, distinguishing. So when we have learning objectives, we're going to put them in these terms if we can. And this is more complex cognitive processes. We, we know that a student is more likely to um, actually, you know, referring back to the, the last section, actually um, encode the information, truly remember it. Um, if they are doing these things and if they have the ability to to create something from it, to evaluate something, uh, to analyze, to apply, to understand, and the most basic being to remember. Um, so you see that it's sort of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs going from least complex to most complex, uh, being able to create something from information you already have. Okay, so we've referred to this uh, a little bit talking about schemas. Um, the idea of a concept. It's a category used to group similar objects, events, ideas, or people. So think about furniture. Is that a category? Yes. Group similar objects. Um, I'm sitting at a desk right now on top of a chair. They are both furniture. Well, the desk is not on top of the chair. I am. Okay. You don't, don't get confused. But what about this guy? The platypus I mentioned. A bird, a duck, a mammal, its attributes, it has a duck bill, it lays eggs, it has fur, it has four webbed feet, it has a tail and swims underwater. What is it? It's a mammal. But it does not fit, it does not assimilate. It must be accommodated into our concept of what a mammal is. It does not fit the stereotypical, or a word we're going to use, the prototypical idea of uh, a mammal. The simplicity principle says we induce the simplest category to cover the most examples. Humans like to categorize to make sense of our world and in the past we could get away with this one for instance male and female. Now, now we, you know if I make a survey asking people if they're male or female somebody may get offended because I did not in include the possibility that they may be uh, transgendered for instance. Um, but we like to have simple categories and we love to categorize things. Um, theories of concept formation. The rule theory um, says that students discover the concepts um, through, through these sorts of different strategies, maybe a gambling strategy, um, a conservative focusing strategy, uh, um, putting things in categories based on defining features as all the square things or um, some sort of non-defining feature uh, which is less common and the idea that um, it's limited to simple and un unambiguous concepts um, so we do have rules for for how we put things into categories is the main thing I want you to understand here um, the prototype theory 
is, uh, involves the best representation of a category or class. Research suggests that the majority of real world concepts are structured by typical attributes rather than by rules. Okay, we don't always ru use rules. You must have this, 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 and this, and this to be a mammal. We think of a typical or a prototypical mammal and then we compare other things to that and say, is it prototypical? Is it similar? to the prototype. And the less similar it is, the less likely it is to be categorized with it. We have the idea of an exemplar, which is like a prototype, but we're using a highly typical example of a category, not necessarily the most prototypical. Real examples experienced by individuals. Um, so what is the most uh, what is a highly typical example of a fruit? Not necessarily the fruit that is the most typical. It, it, it has the most features of a fruit. Um, think of a male. What it, who's a male you can think of versus who is the most male person that you you know that you know. The prototype theory says that children should first learn concepts by having adults show examples that are typical. When examples are not typical or are ambiguous, means vague, defining attributes is best. So we want to use the rule theory for those, for, for atypical things or, or vague things. We want to look at the characteristics and establish what rule it follows to identify what category it fits in. So maybe ask students to retrieve exemplars from their memory. Uh, that is the exemplar theory. What's an example of a mammal? What's an example of a southern state? Um, and then we can often activate a schema. What's what? How does a wedding occur? Well, well people show up. They they do things in this order. There are pubos involved. There are people walking down the aisle, bride side, groom side, you know, etc. We have a schema, and, and when that schema is activated, uh, we try to fit things into it, assimilate, or accommodate. Um, concept attainment model says that students discover the concept, teacher writes the titles, examples, and non-examples, and students then develop hypotheses based on the examples and non-examples in three stages, presenting examples and non-examples so that the students can infer the concept to be learned, and then checking to see if the students have understood the concept by distinguishing the examples from the non-examples and what the differences are, and then have students analyze their thinking strategies, namely how they generated the different hypotheses about the attributes. This is something that you can do to express a concept or to explain it to your students. You can also use a concept map uh, where visualization and organization techniques um, consist of constructing maps representing the relationship among concepts. This is a good way to understand how things are related and we commonly do this when we are you know learning theories. Here's how things are related. Uh, students go to school, schools are in a certain neighborhood, um, you know, and you could do this um, with a number of different things. You, you need to know various things about, um, uh, let's say, football. Alabama, SEC, NCAA, football. Quarterback, um, lineman, wide receiver, you know, etc. There can be so many offshoots of a central concept such as this. Uh, leading in different directions, allowing you to sort of um, have a conceptual map of how everything is related. And you might, in some cases, have you know a line going from here to cats, um, jointed limbs, um, things like that. Um, misconceptions uh, would involve invalid concepts, naive theories. Um, when we undergeneralize or overgeneralize, incorrect analogies and misconceptions um, realizing that misconceptions are really difficult to change when we when we have these um, 
we we can get really confused. Um, uh, the biggest problem is being under and over generalization. Uh, methods that promote conceptual change. Uh, we have really three students need to experience a cognitive conflict between their existing concept and the new concept. Anytime we create that, well, did you know that, you know, Nevada, you know, California goes further east than Nevada. Anytime you can challenge somebody's preconception, their, their conception of, of how the world is, you elicit some sort of disturbance, a, a cognitive conflict, or what we call cognitive dissonance. And when they have that, they try to fix it. They try to understand it. It, it will inspire some curiosity, hopefully. Um, the new concept needs to make sense, and the new concept should be useful in addressing new problems or situations. I'm not going to get into these also uh, bullet points. Um, in thought, we manipulate and transform information in our working memory using multiple cognitive processes, some most of which we've mentioned, rehearsal, elaboration, organization, visualization, storing, encoding, and retrieval. Reasoning can be deductive or inductive. I've discussed that in the past. Deductive is to deduce. Uh, from a number of examples. Let's see how this would apply to one example. Inductive reasoning is looking at one example and generalizing from what has occurred in one situation. Uh, in decision making, we evaluate alternative options and make, uh, making choices. But we have flaws in our logic, thinking flaws. Um, these are all scrunched together, I apologize. I also apologize for using the word scrunched, but these are, I think, important for us to focus on for a moment. Confirmation bias. The tendency to look for information that confirms rather than refutes our thoughts. We do this all the time, all day long. We search for things that support our views. If you're a conservative, you probably watch Fox News. If you're a liberal, you probably watch um, John Stewart. Hopefully you watch him anyway because he's sort of funny, but you, you get the idea. We watch TV shows, news that supports our views. Um, we don't want to watch things, uh, for instance, a news channel that is going to constantly conflict with our ways of seeing the world. Hindsight bias is another one. The tendency to falsely report what we have, that we accurately predicted an event once the event occurs. Your mom comes to you and says, oh, I knew that girl was no good for you. She was, I knew, knew from the first time I met her, she was bad news. No, you didn't, mom. You, you had no idea. But we like to think that we knew. We like to think that we knew ahead of time. Overconfidence bias, the tendency to be more optimistic about alternatives that we would be or then we would be if we had considered probabilities or past experience. We are overconfident. Belief perseverance. The tendency, this is sort of like confirmation bias, the tendency to hold on to a belief despite the presence of contradictory evidence. We avoid that contradictory ev evidence, says the confirmation bias, and our beliefs are likely to persevere. With creative thinking and um, creativity in general, we're likely to consider um, ideas like intrinsic motivation, uh, which, which leads to greater creativity, but we're going to think about uh, the novelty of an idea, unique ideas and thought. Highly creative people often have higher IQs, and higher IQ people, however, are not necessarily creative. Um, high, um, highly creative people have divergent thinking. They think of a number of different objects. Uh, sorry, not objects, options and alternatives. They, they think of uh, alternative viewpoints. Uh, that is divergent thinking. Um, intelligence versus creativity. Again, convergent thinking is um, really has to do with intelligence, while divergent thinking has to do with creativity. Um, convergent 
thought is pulling several pieces of information together to draw a conclusion or solve a problem. It brings us a single answer, whereas divergent thinking brings us many answers. We start with an idea and take it in many different directions. In promoting creative thought, we create a sense of mastery in a domain. We create a self, sorry, a safe learning environment, autonomy, supporting learning environment. We want to encourage brainstorming in our students, model creativity, demonstrate the value of it, and allow students time to be creative. Sometimes we don't do this. And sometimes even as parents, we don't do this. We, we say, hey, play this game. Instead of, hey, there are rocks in the backyard, make a fort out of rocks. You know, I, I'm being a little ridiculous, but you get the idea that when giving, given time and sometimes even boredom, instead of get busy with this, then people will become creative. They will find ways to make their lives more interesting. And sometimes we just fill up our days and do not allow for autonomy, A. We do what is regimented, what is built in. And sometimes we just stay busy all day. And sometimes we don't allow ourselves to freely think, to daydream, and to think about possibilities and get creative. In critical thought, we systematically examine available information and come up with conclusions that are based on evidence. Let me say that again. Systematically examine the information that's available to us, and then we conclude based on any evidence we have. So we kind of research and then conclude. Students are not likely to engage in critical thought on their own spontaneously. There are four elements that we, we need to think about. They need to be motivated. They need to have some knowledge about the issue in order to get started. They need to have some metacognitive abilities and some basic skills that they can use to get started. So some basic knowledge, some basic skills, the motivation, and the ability to think about the process, metacognition. In problem solving, um, we need a well-defined problem. We, know, we need to know what we are dealing with. If we have that, we're more likely to solve the problem. If it's a vague or ambiguous or ill-defined problem, that requires more creativity. And we often have some sort of problem-solving model that we turn to. Um, we might think about this five-stage um, model of problem-solving. Uh, ident identify problems and opportunities, define the goals and represent the problem, maybe with a model. Explore possible strategies, like, well, we could, you know, um, do this, or we could try that. We could surround them, we could take them in a frontal attack. We could, uh, again, a lot of my examples are violent. It's too much uh, video games. A, anticipate outcomes and act. And L, look back and learn. So really, what are we doing here? We're, we're kind of dealing with some of this. We're looking at a process and being metacognitive about it. So we're, we're looking at the problem, solving it, looking back and seeing how we solved it, and hopefully monitoring it while we, while we were solving the problem. Factors that hinder problem solving. When we are rigid in our thinking, when we don't think outside the box, this is cognitive rigidity. Um, and we might not realize um, that this desk can also, like, maybe I need to dust the ceiling fan. And I'm sitting at a desk. Man, but that's a desk. I don't have a ladder. Man, I'm out of luck. I need to dust that ceiling fan, but, but I'm out of luck. Um, because this desk is meant for writing on. Definitely could not, you know could not stand on. wait I could stand on it so when I don't have cognitive rigidity when I realize that the function of a desk is not necessarily fixed um, I can I can get more interesting I can um, I can be more flexible and, and find solutions and get creative normally we go to a response set or a mental set of of, of usual solutions um, 
Affective means emotional. So we're going to look at affective and motivational factors. When they're when they are um, sorry detrimental emotions or detrimental motivations or a motivational uh, factors, that's an issue. We're going to have anxiety, um, uh, for instance, and that will hurt us on a test. For instance, that'll hurt us in problem solving. Um, so the more anxious we get. Although a certain level of anxiety is actually motivating. Um, so just think about too much um, of any negative emotion um, can, can be debilitating. Okay. Transfer is something that I mentioned earlier, but um, waited till now to talk about um, extending what has been learned in one context to a new context. So I have this um, chart. Um, general transfer, there's really not a lot of research for, but in terms of specific transfer, let's think about near and far transfer, and then positive and negative transfer. Of course, these are all positive, and then we have negative. So near is overlap between situations, original, and the transfer context, which is the new context, um, need to be similar. This means, you know, um, say, um, if you were um, a Marine and you um, become a contracted, um, um, basically a mercenary, uh, you'd probably be doing some, somewhat the same thing. Um, if you come back and you're a, a policeman in a small town, that might be more, that would be further transfer. Um, less overlap, I wouldn't say little overlap, but less overlap between situations, original and the transfer settings are um, less similar. So far, far transfer means very little similarity normally. Positive, what is learned in one context actually enhances the learning in a different setting, whereas negative transfer, um, when, that's, that's sort of like um, um, it's an it's an inhibitory thing, um, sort of like uh, when I was talking about um, in a previous section, I was talking about how um, my new address conflicts with me remembering my old address. Um, well, this is sort of similar. What is learned in one context actually hinders or delays learning something in a different setting. Um, so. That's positive and negative transfer. Um, factors that affect positive transfer are the level of the student's knowledge, the meaningfulness of the original learning, how well they learned it um, in the first place. If they didn't learn it well, it's, it's not going to help. Um, if they didn't learn it well, though, it's not going to hurt if they're trying to learn in a new context that is different. The similarity matters between the two contexts, of course. The context of the original learning uh, really matters. Uh, metacognitive skills and instructions for transferring the knowledge from one context to the new one. Okay, um, I'll be back with you shortly in sociocognitive and constructivist views of learning. This is Dr. Gooden. Thank you.